Hi. Um, this is hi. So I want to talk about something that's related to what we do, but I think puts it in a little bit of a larger context that I find very interesting. Um, and that's namely uh, this piece around the end of privacy, which is broadly around issues of trust, issues of evolution, and, and how I see these things going forward. Uh, I think I will scare you a little bit, and then hopefully I will leave you with some amount of hope in there too. So this was inspired by a book that was very influential on me uh, that I read at this point about 12 years ago. Uh, and this is by a fellow named Robert Wright. Uh, and I don't want it to go this way. And what he was trying to figure out is what is the logic behind all evolution, right? How did we go from essentially a set of molecules to a single-celled organism to larger organisms? But also, how did we go from cities to nations to things like the WTO? And his unifying piece around that was this idea of non-zero-sum interactions. And so you're like, whoa, what's that? And so I I'll give you a very simple example, which is namely, you know, we all know the story of David and his Goliath. And so if you look at this story, it's very clear that there is a zero-sum interaction here. If this guy beats up this other fellow, he loses, right? And the other guy wins. So thus, they both win, or one wins and one loses. But what's interesting is what happens when four of the little guys get together. Now, if you see, these guys now all of a sudden have a non-zero-sum relationship. If they win, they all win. And if they lose, they all lose together, right? And so essentially, this piece, this factor of essentially working together to solve some common problem, usually precipitated by a very zero-sum interaction, a conflict, gets you to this place where you begin to evolve. And so that's his primary po po uh, hypothesis. And I think it's a very interesting one. And there's all sorts of things where this comes up. War is clearly a case where you and I work together, or me in another city, or me in another nation work together, and we then form larger units. Trade also has this, right? I'm gaining and you're gaining. We're both consciously and willingly entering into this trade. And then there are other sort of more subtle things like specialization, that if I get better and better at one little activity, uh, you know, this activity has greater benefit to me and the people around me. And so what's interesting as you look, this is essentially the process by which, you know, cells began to get together, people began to work together, villages began to work together to form into larger cities, and, and so on and so on. Until we get to this piece and we say, well, what are the factors that then come out here? So clearly we want these win-win interactions, right? Uh, we want more empathy, right? That one of the hallmarks that comes out of this, that our genes or evolution designed, right, is that if I want to care for my children and care for my well, uh, fellow man, empathy and love seem to be things that come out of it. Namely, trade, and trade requires trust and reputation. If I want to have a long-term relationship to you, and you're working together, you can't screw me over. And thus, I need to develop a reputation as somebody who's trustworthy. But there's also negative pieces that I think are very interesting, too. Um, namely, we get less freedom, right? The state of, you know, or the city of Chennai right now, for all of its rhetoric, cannot independently decide to go to war with Sri Lanka. And similarly, my cells, even as I'm flicking them off my fingers, right, can't basically decide to do something differently. We're all in this together. So we're essentially trading in this process of evolution. And this is a key point. We're trading freedom for security. We're trading the freedom that we have in terms of making our own decisions and doing things that are consciously, you know, just what I want to do for the security of being within a bigger collective and the safety that comes with that. And so, you know, thus, if you look at where does this go, where does this end up in the long run? And clearly, things like the UN, right, seem to be it. You get bigger and bigger organizational units. And what's interesting is this seems to be over and over again driven by interdependence, but also that threat and terrorism and viruses seem to play a big role in this. And, and I'll give you an example. So, you know, what drives these things? You know, the answer is usually pirates, like many things. So uh, there's an interesting story of if how did Italy become a, uh, Italy and not just a collection of city-states, like we think of them in mythology. Oh, they're, the, you know, the Romans versus the, you know, guys from Athens. And so what happened was, essentially, these pirates, what they would do is they would go and attack one city. And they would, you know, go through and do all of the pillaging that pirates do. And then they'd leave. And then they'd go attack another city. And so basically the people throughout Italy began to get together and said, if we're going to solve this problem, what we need is a unified navy. And then we need a way to decide who's in charge of that unified navy. 
And the only way to do that was essentially to make this bigger political structure that we now call Italy, right? And so what I think is interesting is obviously there's parallels as we go forward, right? As new actors basically figure out security holes that we make, we, I, I think we inevitably, as the terrorist threats and the ability for the terrorists to use technology, are pushing ourselves toward these larger units, right? These larger political units with all of the things that that entails. And, and we'll explore that a little bit. And so the US had this, and this led to a whole new set of things around the Patriot Act and surveillance. And clearly, Mumbai and India had a similar piece. And as I began to research this, you know, I thought it was really interesting just in terms of this loss of freedom and how this comes in and, and how consciously and how deep in many ways these things are. So you know, one of the things that boggles my mind is if you ask, how did the Mumbai terrorists get caught? And it's like, well, they made a bunch of phone calls on the sea from, in, from outside Mumbai in Pakistan. And so who gets to know about those phone calls and more importantly, the location of those phone calls? The NSA. This boggles my mind. Right? Namely that if each of us in this room right now make a call to Pakistan, the US government knows where we are in real time. This is the price that a company or a country needs to pay to interact with the plus one system that is our telephone network. That boggles my mind. So some of these things are happening, right? The other piece that I found out was this very interesting group with a very innocuous name called the I2 group, right? And so, you know, they, this is their website. They say 80% of the world's national security organizations exploit I2 natural solutions. And, you know, they also brag about things like uh, 150 countries worldwide use them. And what's interesting is if you do the math and you look at Amnesty International's list of countries with human rights violations, there's 80 of them on there. There's only 240. Do the math, right? Um, so what's interesting is that this is the biggest organization in the world essentially providing surveillance technology. And you're like, what are they doing? And so when we were out raising money for Baba Job, we met an investor who actually put money in. Make? What does that mean? And like, well, and we can do it by person, by social network, geography, and time which again sounds really vague. So what does that really mean? And so when you begin to break that down at a very deep level, and this is some of the videos they put up on their site, and I think it's really interesting. So over here you have a person, right? And if you look really closely, you see these are all the land records associated with them. These are the prison records associated with them. This is every telephone, financial call, or pr passport immigration record that they make. And they provide this 360 degree analysis of essentially what is happening, right? And so if you go through, and I'll, I'll blow this up, they basically can integrate almost any piece of data together, right? And so if you look at this, they say, hey, we can take CCTV footage, which includes encoding of license plate numbers, which then can be looked up against car records and see who's driving where. We can do all audio recordings, like you know every single telephone call conversation that's being happening in real time. They can do any biometrics. They can do all websites and plus, you know, the normal stuff of Facebook, Gmail, telephone records, financial data, and everything else. And they correlate all of it, right? Obviously, you have to be in the security apparatus to use this. But this is what they do. And what's interesting is how they boast, right? If I go forward, that they say they have 350 users, or 1,000 users, and 4,500 security organizations. And this is the boasting package that I thought was really amazing. They said that 90% of all target packages were identified with their software. That means they are the guys that figure out who the drone should kill. That's their main job, right? They're saying, if I do a social networking analysis of all telephone calls, records of where anybody is traveling, how do I identify the missing center that is Osama bin Laden, or that is you know, the number two guy or, or at, you know, in an Al-Qaeda network, whatever. And then, you know, to give them an idea, like the vast amount of data between wiretapping records, investigation and reports, and it was impossible to sort through without I2's products, right? What's interesting is, you know, a year ago they got bought by IBM. Um, <laughs> IBM has the biggest, you know, sales force selling to governments in the whole world. Uh, it was about $4 billion. And so, you know, you look at who's using them, 80% of the world's organizations, and now, obviously, NatGrid, right? This is one of the biggest uh, technology suppliers that's there. So, and what's interesting is if you do a search on the Ministry of Home Affairs, under which NatGrid lives, there's nothing there. It's the other true story I think is very interesting. On Baba Job, we had a complaint of a theft, right? Um, and so, basically, we had invited this job seeker that had been accused of theft down to our office on the pretense that, hey, there's another interview. 
and he was late. And we're like, well, where is he? And the cop's like, just give me his mobile number. And we're like, okay. And 10 minutes later, right, he knew his real-time location, right? So this means that today in India, and this was seven months ago, that any telephone number can be looked up via location lookup without a warrant by any beat cop, right? Because this is happening. Second thing, my good friend Ashwin Mahesh, who I love in terms of his working that he's doing, has basically worked to basically do high-definition uh, high video cameras that are all out. You know, there's 60,000 of these throughout London. They're now in Bangalore, too. These have the other potential that it, you can hook them up, it hasn't been done yet, to the license, port, uh, to license plate encoding readers, so you can figure out where all of those things are. Where does this come up? So this is from uh, one of the intelligence agencies from Tehelka, and it was like, the success of MI5 in identifying matching voice samples between conversations in Pakistan and in UK, and comparing them with their data space of all known people that could be bad, underscores why we need NetGrid. So basically this means, like, at this point, every conversation in, is being recorded. Don't forget that. Uh, so I have some fears, obviously. If you look at who in the world has the strongest privacy laws, it's Germany, right? Because they have the darkest history with exploiting these things for evil. We need stronger laws there, absolutely. Uh, if you go to the next part, you know, if you look at this, it will be pushed out, and there's many folks that want to push it out, and there are good reasons to do so, right? to the beat level person. But there's still this element that if you can imagine that any beat cop can know every place, your entire social network, who you know that's rich, anything that sort of seems anomalous, this is coming and it's coming relatively quickly. And I don't, I don't know if we as a society have really embraced or even understood all of what that means. But I do think it's inevitable. And this is my other point, that we may have struggled with technology. Fuck. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Is it going to stay? Hopefully. But there's a part of me that says, you know, on the flip side, it just takes one major attack, which is certainly possible, that one guy gets a dirty bomb and puts it in Buenos Aires or puts it in New York City, and we will all immediately throw up our hands and say, if the chance of these things are reduced by 10%, we will gladly give up those civil liberties. And I'd argue past, this is what has happened, and that may be an entirely okay trade-off. But the question is, well, what could remain in terms of the rights that we would want even after such a horrific act of terrorism? And so, oh man, this thing is frustrating. So the part that I, that I sort of propose is, hey, it's important that if I'm not accused of a crime, that as an extension to the Right of to Information Act, I should know what the government thinks it knows about me. Like, I got pulled over the other day by a cop, and he'd taken a picture of my license plate. This is right on Richmond Road. And he said, you've got three outstanding parking violations on February 22nd. And I'm like, but I was in America, and my wife was in America also on February 22nd. So I know my car wasn't there. So obviously, there's going to be bad data in these systems, right? And so we, as individuals, I think, have a right to see, again, is there bad data? And then secondly, we need real audit trails, right? Clearly this stuff is dangerous enough that not everybody should know it, not everybody should have access to it. It shouldn't take a 500 rupee bribe to basically get to know everything about anybody that's ever been interesting to me or me. So what's the bright side of all of this? So clearly, there's computer issues. So what I look at is, you know, this fellow here run the Nobel Prize for essentially figuring out an alternative trust system. If you look at these women, these women didn't have any sense of identity. They didn't have the ability to essentially bet on their future earnings because they were deemed not good enough of a credit risk. And so his major invention was to say, well, if we group all of them together, we can aggregate that risk and thus actually give them a loan. And I would argue if we had better identity via things like UID, right? They wouldn't actually be forced to say, oh, I know this woman's husband is a drunk. I'm not sure if I want to be in the same boat from a risk pool with her, right? And so there's this piece by having no identity and no trust, right? The poor of India really gets screwed. And, and we can attest to this at Babaja, right? So, you know, I started Babaja really as a way to address what I saw was this incredible inequity that we see everywhere around us, right? And it was you know, my little experiment in quest to see, can I do something about it that's going to work at scale? And so if you look, you know, we have two 
real job seekers that are in our database, Kavita and Gina. And what's interesting is they share very similar backgrounds, but they earn radically different amounts. And so why is this true? Well, in the case of Kavita, if you're born in the slum, and educated in the slum, and only know other people in the slum, you tend to get jobs within the slum. But in the case of Gina, she had that access to somebody else that could pay more, and she was able to basically earn the trust through that social network to get that larger piece of salary. And so these two bits of access and trust, right, are key to essentially somebody earning more money, right? When we go ask employers, what is it that you want from our job seekers, they say, government documents, experiment, experience, and a willingness to work at the pay, a wage that I've got, right? But this sense of government documents is all about trust. It's if something goes wrong in that relationship, do I have recourse? And because there's no identity systems, we can't do it. Now, we've been doing a lot on the access problem, right? So we do stuff around a call center, around automated voice systems, around things on SMS and the PC, and we've made a reasonably, a, a reasonable amount of progress, right? We've got a lot of jobs listed, we've got over 750,000 people. And there's some real metrics that are very good that we're very proud of. of people that get jobs in our system earn 20% more on average, their commutes go down, and these are all choices that they're making. And that's a very important piece in terms of giving people greater choices in terms of their livelihoods is one of the most fundamental freedoms that any of us can have. But I'll take that a step further and say, I know that this will be enhanced if the trust systems get better. Right? To namely say, we haven't done this yet, but this is with one of the things that we'd like to do with folks like the UID. So, th so that even Kavito, who's just used a phone and probably just talked to a call center person, can say, here's my UID number, so that you know if something goes wrong, you can get me. Right? That I am entering into a trusted relationship with you, and there is recourse here. And this is a very important concept that is needed, right? And it's sort of the flip side to giving up all this freedom, that people can then say, I will earn more money because I, you can bet on me. And so finally, you know, on one sense I say, well, this world where these surveillance technologies are all around us is very scary. But the other side is, you know, what alternatives do we have? And I would argue that the only alternative that we have is a more trusting, more interdependent, interdependent, more connected world. And that's going to require that we give up certain things. But I think that's the only path, right? And so, you know, the things of what can you guys do? I think there are lots of tools out there like Baba Job, but many, many others to essentially empower the poor with more identity and greater access. I actually think WikiLeaks are terribly important to know the bad stuff so that we can consciously say, I know the government does dirty things sometimes. It may be necessary, but let's at least have a conversation about that. And then finally, this essential right to sort of see and audit our own data, right? So that we can know, oh, there seems to be an error here. What's up? And with that, I want to say thanks. I am at zero seconds. Thanks. Thanks so much, John.